Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Masonic Cancer Center seminar. Um, Dan Harkai will introduce our speaker today. Do I introduce now or in a couple? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. You can go ahead okay. and introduce our speaker today. No problem. Well, thanks everyone and good morning. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, introduce our speaker this morning, uh, Luke Hepner uh, from the Hormel Institute. Uh, uh, Luke received his BS degree um, in genetics from University of Wisconsin-Madison and uh, was a graduate of the University of Minnesota with a PhD uh, in cancer biology in 2010. Uh, after that, um, Luke uh, pursued postdoctoral research at the Mayo Clinic in cancer biology uh, and then uh, began uh, his independent career at uh, the Hormel Institute in August of 2015. Uh, as an assistant professor. Uh, in addition uh, to that, um, I can't find it in my notes here, but I, uh, Luke, you're, you're the director of uh, the cancer biology at the Hormel Institute. Is that correct? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I, I, thought, I thought you had uh, some other uh, role, so for my apologies. Um, but anyway, uh, it's great to have Luke uh, here uh, this morning uh, to present uh, our seminar. And I think we're going to hear about uh, uh, regulation of lung cancer growth and uh, a very interesting molecule, DARP32. So uh, with that, the floor is yours, Luke. Thanks for the nice introduction, Dan. Thank you, everyone, for um, joining us and for the opportunity to share my work with you. Um, I would love to be there in person. Um, obviously, that's not possible right now, but I look forward to um, visiting the main campus and discussing collaborations and making further connections with um, my colleagues there. Um, I'm, as Dan said, at the Hormel Institute in Austin, Minnesota, and today I'll be sharing my work um, about molecular regulation of lung cancer and therapeutic resistance by DARP32. My lab is focused um, on lung cancer, but also um, I was telling Dan before we started that um, we do some vascular biology work um, using zebrafish as a model of vascular permeability, and I look forward to sharing that work another time. So um, as this audience is well aware, lung cancer is one of the deadliest types of cancer. Um, it's the most deadly cancer, both in the United States and worldwide in adult men and women. Um, part of the reason that lung cancer is particularly deadly is that when it's localized, it can be treated relatively well. But as the problem is that um, most lung cancer doesn't get diagnosed um, when it's in the early stages, and when it gets diagnosed in an advanced stage, when it's um, in a regional location or worse in a distant location um, with metastases, the five-year survival rate is poor. Um, so there's a lot that can be done to improve detection, but also um, we, new therapies are needed to help treat lung cancer and prevent um, therapeutic resistance, especially in advanced stage lung cancer. So um, I'm gonna briefly touch on some of the different subtypes of lung cancer because my talk, um, various aspects of my talk entail different types of lung cancer. So small cell lung cancer is typically of neuroendocrine origin and constitutes about 15% of lung cancer cases. Um, the remaining 85% of lung cancers are non-small cell lung cancer, um, which typically is of epithelial cell origin. And among these 85% of non-small cell lung cancers, um, about 40% are adenocarcinomas, 25% um, are squamous cell carcinoma, 15% is large cell carcinoma, and then there's um, another 20% that's um, not well specified. Um, I'm going to focus on adenocarcinoma, particularly toward the end of my talk, um, EGFR mutated lung adenocarcinoma, as well as um, small cell lung cancer. So um, with that, um, just to give you a brief outline of what I'll be discussing today, I'll share some background about um, the protein we're studying called DARP32. Um, next, I'll talk about the small cell lung cancer work um, and the role of ASCL1 regulation, 
regulation of DARP32 and an isoform of DARP32 called TDARP in neuroendocrine tumor cell growth and survival. And then finally, I'll wrap up with the role of DARP32 in growth and resistance mechanisms of EGFR mutated non small cell lung cancer. So, DARP32 um, is a phosphoprotein. Um, it's, the full name is dopamine and cyclic AMP regulated phosphoprotein, and it's 32 kilodaltons in size, which is where the 32 comes from. Um, DARP32 was classically known as a molecule or a protein that's involved in neurons and has neurog neurologic roles in terms of regulation of dopamine signaling. Um, it acts as an inhibitor of protein phosphatase one, so it can modulate um, signaling activity by inhibiting kinases or um, causing activation of them by um, not being not stimulating the PP1 activity. Um, and it acts as a medium spiny neuron marker. In the early 2000s, Dr. Wayla Rupiai identified the role of DARP32 in gastric cancer. So prior to that, um, it had been discovered in neurology by Paul Greengard, but then um, in the early 2000s, its role in oncogenesis became more apparent and it was found to be overexpressed in gastric cancer. And as I've discussed in the last 20 years, it's come to be shown to have an important role in tumor genesis, drug resistance, and cell migration, and other functional processes involved in oncogenesis. So DARP32 modulates signaling via regulation of protein phosphatase one. Um, a variety of kinases are capable of phosphorylating DARP32 at various positions. And most notably, DARP32 can get phosphorylated at threonine 34 position, which leads to inhibition of PP1 activity, kinase activation, and regulation of signaling. So um, the take home message from this slide is just that DARP32 is able to modulate signaling via regulation of PP1. Um, taking a step back and looking at the role of DARP32 in dopamine signaling um, more in neurons, dopamine signaling can lead to, um, through dopamine D1 receptor, can lead to phosphorylation of DARP32 at um, 3 and 34, which inhibits PP1, as I mentioned. Um, signaling through dopamine D2 receptor um, and other receptors can lead to inhibition of this. And um, that kind of exemplifies how it can be modulated. Um, the reason that I bring up its role in dopamine signaling is this is how we first became interested in DARP32. So when I was a postdoc um, at Mayo Clinic in Dr. Deb Mukapai's lab, we were focused on understanding the role of dopamine signaling in lung cancer. And Dr. Mukapai's group had shown in the early 2000s that dopamine signaling can antagonize VEGF signaling by preventing its phosphorylation. So as a postdoc, I showed that dopamine signaling in tumor-associated endothelial cells can lead to a decrease in angiogenesis and specifically tumor angiogenesis. So that's, that's how we started to become focused on dopamine signaling and DARP32 because DARP32 is downstream of this. But I want to emphasize that this work was done in tumor-associated endothelial cells, and the work I'm going to talk about today is focused on the role of DARP32 in cancer cells of either epithelial or neuroendocrine origin. So as I mentioned, in the early 2000s, Dr. Whale of Rupiah's group identified DARP32, a novel isoform of DARP32 called TDARP in human gastric cancer. So TDARP is an N-terminally truncated form of DARP32, and this was first identified in cancer um, in the early 2000s. And importantly, TDARP lacks this T34 um, residue. So it's um, its protein homology is completely the same as DARP32. It just lacks the first 36 amino acids, um, which obviously includes this threonine 34 site. So 
full length DARP32 is able to inhibit PP1 when this T34 is phosphorylated, but TDR protein lacks that ability because it doesn't have the T34 site and it doesn't inhibit PP1. So as I'll talk about, there's some evidence that TDARP overexpression can lead to oncogenesis. So I apologize for this busy slide, but um, I just want to spend one slide to summarize a lot of the work that's been done with DARP32 in particular in other cancers. So overexpression of DARP32 promotes oncogenesis in breast, prostate, colon, and stomach adenocarcinomas. Um, and Tdarp has been shown to promote cell survival and growth through AKT and PI3 kinase and mediate Herceptin resistance in breast and esophageal cancers. Um, Darp32 has been shown to promote gefetinib resistance in gastric cancer, and I'll talk about its role in, of, in gefetinib resistance in lung cancer. Um, Darp32 also regulates invasion and angiogenesis in gastric cancer. And recently, um, it's been shown that H. pylori induced cell death is counteracted by NF kappa B mediated transcription of DARP32. Um, DARP32 has also been impl implicated in glucose metabolism and shown to promote STAT3 signaling in cancer. It activates IGF 1R. And recently, um, Dr. Bagchi's group, um, Dr. Bagchi was, gave a talk in the seminar series recently. Um, if he had shown that loss of HIF-1 alpha and pancreatic cancer decreases DARP32 expression and degrades P53 to promote metastasis. And he talked about this work, um, as I mentioned in this seminar series, which was an interesting talk that he gave and um, shed some light on the role of DARP32 in pancreatic cancer, which hadn't been known before this report recently. So um, just to summarize, um, DARP32 is involved in a variety of hallmarks of cancer and able to regulate um, a lot of these processes that are involved in oncogenesis. And the signaling that DARP32 regulates um, includes um, regulation of STAT3 signaling. Um, it also interacts with EGFR and ERBB3, which I'm going to discuss to regulate AKT and PA3 kinase signaling. Um, it has the ability to inhibit PP1 and um, a variety of other processes that control invasion, proliferation, survival, and other processes. So um, with that, I'll get into um, what we hypothesize and how we started our work looking at DARP32 in lung cancer. Um, this work was led by um, Dr. Kayam Alam, a talented postdoc in my group, as have most of the work that I'll be presenting today. And we hypothesized that given the multifaceted role of DARP32 and TDARP in promoting oncogenesis in a variety of adenocarcinomas, does DARP32 promote lung tumor genesis? So, before we started this project five or six years ago, um, about the same time I was starting my lab at the Hormel Institute and um, also starting this work as a postdoc at Mayo as I transitioned into um, starting my own lab, we, um, the role of DARP32 in lung cancer hadn't been appreciated. So we wanted to see, given the role of DARP32 in other cancers, if it was involved in lung, lung cancer, excuse me. So um, we performed some in vitro studies that suggested DARP32 was involved in lung cancer, which I'll summarize um, in a little bit. But I, for the sake of time, I'm going to start with the in vivo work. Um, we knocked down DARP32 in a variety of lung cancer lines. So um, human A549, lung adenocarcinoma, H1650 and H226, which is a squamous cell line. Um, and in all these lung cancer cell lines, we knocked down DARP32 and then performed xenotransplantation experiments where we implanted the human cells orthotopically into the lungs of mice. And these cells are luc luciferase labeled, um, stably transduced with luciferase and the DARP32 shRNAs so we can track them over time. 
And after the tumors take, we um, image them periodically, and we can see that DARP32 causes a decrease in tumor growth in all three of the different cell lines that we tested, suggesting that DARP32 knockdown can reduce the tumor growth. So next, um, to get at the translational applicability of this work, we wanted to confirm that this was, that DARP32 was overexpressed in lung and adenocarcinoma patients. So in collaboration with Dr. Aaron Mansfield and Dr. Anya Roden at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, we um, obtained 62 specimens from um, lung cancer patients, from 62 patients. And we looked at DARP32 using an antibody that recognizes um, an N-terminal epitope. So this only recognizes DARP32, it doesn't recognize TDARP. And then here we use an antibody that has an epitope um, in the C-terminal region. So it recognizes both isoforms. And we were able to um, determine the relative amount of TDARP by subtracting the staining of both from with it taking it relative to the TDARP, the DARP32 staining. And we correlated this with tumor staging score. So the tumor node metastasis, the T part of that. Um, and we see that TDARP to both isoform ratio. So the relative amount of TDARP increases as the tumor staging score increases. So we concluded that high relative expression of TDARP correlates with tumor growth in lung cancer patients. And to confirm this, we relied on the Cancer Genome Atlas data, um, TCGA data, and using a bioinformatics approach, we confirmed that the same trend was true um, in over 500 um, specimens that were available um, through TCGA. And we also showed based on TCGA data that a high um, relative expression of TDARP to DARP32 ratio, so higher TDARP correlates with worsened survival in patients, overall survival. So um, to summarize this work, um, what I didn't show you, um, I have highlighted here in red, we did perform some in vitro studies showing that DARP32 isoforms promote cell survival by activating AKT and MAP kinase signaling um, in a variety of non-small cell lung cancer lines and that DARP32 proteins interact with IKK alpha um, to increase um, nuclear NF-kappa B2, P52 translocation and enhance cell migration in vitro, um, which is some work that we're following up on in terms of how DARP32 interacts with IKK-alpha. Um, and then we also showed um, in vivo results that knockdown of DARP32 reduces tumor growth and that upregulation of TDARP in patients correlates with um, an increased T score and worsened overall survival. So this evidence suggests DARP32 might be a negative prognostic marker associated with increasing stages of non-small cell lung cancer and perhaps could be a novel therapeutic target. So with that, I'll move on to the second part of my talk, which is looking at the role of DARP32 in small cell lung cancer. So um, this work we recently published in the British Journal of Cancer, um, and it was led by Dr. Alum with help from another postdoc in my lab, Lee Wong, and a summer undergraduate research experience intern um, named Christina Hernandez, as well as um, collaborators at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Fasari and Rodin, and Dr. Rendong Yang, uh, um, computational biologist, colleague of mine here at the Institute who um, was instrumental in some of the studies that we I'll present. So um, just to provide a short amount of background information, small cell lung cancer, unfortunately, um, is responsible for the death of a quarter of a million people worldwide each year, and this five-year survival rate is only 7%. Um, it's a very aggressive form of lung cancer due to its rapid doubling time and early widespread metastasis. So typically neuroendocrine um, progenitors 
are responsible for small cell lung cancer. Um, that is the cell of origin is neuroendocrine cells with frequent inactivation of P53, RB, and NOTCH signaling. But unlike non-small cell lung cancer, there, there aren't very targetable drivers. Like for example, in, EG, in non-small cell lung cancer, there's EGFR and um, patients can be treated with EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But in small cell lung cancer for the past three decades, most patients would be treated with chemotherapy, but unfortunately um, treatment refractory progression would occur um, often in those patients. And until recently, there couldn't be much done for those patients. Now, um, some immunotherapies are FDA approved for small cell lung cancer, and those are emerging as options for advanced stage patients, but they're very costly and not always available worldwide. So there's definitely a need for understanding the molecular basis of non-small cell lung cancer oncogenesis to develop new therapies um, to um, help treat small cell lung cancer. So given the role of DARP32 in adenocarcinomas, including lung, and the physiological role of DARP32 in neuronal cells, we rationalize that DARP32 given that it is involved in neurons in its physiological role, could play a role in a neuroendocrine cell origin type tumor, such as small cell lung cancer. So we hypothesize that DARP32 might promote neuroendocrine tumor growth in small cell lung cancer. Um, so some of the first studies we performed were again, knocking down or overexpressing DARP32 in human small cell lung cancer cell lines. So here um, we use DMS53 and H1048, again, to human small cell lung cancer cell lines. And um, we overexpressed DARP32 and knocked down DARP32. And we saw that DARP32 promote, protects small cell lung cancer cells from apoptosis as evident by decreased cleave PARP1 and decreased cleave caspase 3 when we overexpressed DARP32 in the opposite trend when we knock it down. And then also a Nexon 5 staining where we see a decrease in early apoptotic cells um, when we um, overexpressed DARP32 and then increase in apoptosis when we knock down DARP32. Um, so we also performed in vivo studies um, using skid mice, similar to the earlier in vivo studies that I showed you. So again, we um, use, we stably knock down DARP32 using two different shRNAs in um, DMS53 cells, which um, we luciferase labeled and injected into mice, and we can track growth over time and we see that DARP32 knockdown decreases tumor growth in these skid mouse models. Um, next, we also overexpress DARP32 and TDARP in um, the DMS53 cell line, as well as the um, H1048 cells. And we see that when we overexpress DARP32 or TDARP, there's an increase in tumor growth in the mouse model. So, um, Next, we collaborated with Farhad Kasari and Anya Rodin at the Mayo Clinic to um, look at some human small cell lung cancer patient specimens in stain for DARP32. So here we're just looking at um, both isoforms of DARP32. And we see that there's um, strong DARP32 staining in SCLC, but in um, physiological, we normal human lung, there's virtually undetectable DARP32 levels, which we'd expect. So this data um, is pilot data that DARP32 is overexpressed in human um, SCLC by IHC. It'd be, um, ideally, we'd do a larger cohort of patients, but this provides um, some initial evidence. Sorry. Um, 
next we collaborated with Dr. Rendong Yang and um, a training in his lab, um, Dr. Yanin Ren, to look at the role of TDARP in SCLCs. So um, we utilized a priorly published RNA-seq data set from Dr. Charles Rudin's group. And that study had looked at about 30 matched specimens from SCLC patients um, before, or mat matched specimens, so adjacent normal tissue and matched um, SCLC tissue. And we looked at the relative amounts of TDARP transcript in these specimens, and we found that um, a handful of patients, specimens in blue here, had high TDARP in the tumor, but undetectable TDARP in the adjacent normal tissue. So we focused on those specific patients and identified upregulated and downregulated genes that were differentially expressed and um, Rendong performed um, gene set enrichment analysis. And one of the most enriched pathways was notch signaling, which we chose to focus on because notch signaling has been implicated in SCLC. And one of the most upregulated genes was ASC01, which is a transcriptional driver of small cell lung cancer. So um, that caused us to focus on ASCL1. So as I mentioned, ASCL1 is a transcriptional regulator of neuroendocrine programming and it acts as a lineage specific oncogene. Um, recently, Dr. Charles Rudin's group has identified the molecular subtypes of SCLC. Um, Dr. Rudin and others in the field have contributed to this work and ASCL1 transcription factor defines the most prevalent group of SCLCs, which is denoted SCLC-A, um, which are of neuroendocrine origin and have high expression of ASCL1. Um, there are several other subtypes that have been, that are classified by these other transcription factors. Um, interestingly, um, we found a prior report in cell reports showing that ChIP-seq data suggested ASCL1 might be recruited to the PP1R1B promoter, which encodes DARP32. So we wanted to look at whether um, ASCL1 is capable of activating DARP32. So does ASCL1 transcriptionally regulate DARP32 to perhaps lead to DARP32 overexpression in SCLC? So Using DMS-53 um, cells, we knocked down ASCL1 in the cell line. Um, Dr. Kaim alum performed this work, and we show that um, using a DARP32 reporter, DARP32 promoter reporter that we obtained from Dr. Arofiai's group, um, we show that when we knock down ASCL1, there's less DARP32 promoter activity so then Dr. Alum um, mutated the ASCL1 binding sites um, that exist within the DARP32 promoter. So there are three of them. He deleted each of them and then all the combinations. And we see that there's a decrease in ASCL1 transcriptional activation of DARP32 upon mutation of these sites. So then using the H1048 cells, which are not in a line that expresses um, much ASCL1. We overexpressed ASCL1 in these cells and um, performed a similar study where um, we mutated the binding sites and we don't see any activation of um, DARP32 promoter in the presence of ASCL1 cDNA. So to summarize this part, um, we show that DARP32 and TDARP stimulate SCLC growth through increased proliferation, AKT and ERK mediated survival and anti-apoptotic signaling. We show that DARP32 isoforms promote SCLC growth in mouse models. 
we show that DARP32 isoforms are overexpressed in patient-derived SCLC tissue, but undetectable in normal human lung. Transcription factor ASCL1 po positively regulates DARP32 expression, and collectively this data suggests that perhaps DARP32 isoforms might represent a negative prognostic indicator for SCLC. So um, for the last um, 15 minutes or so, um, I am going to focus on some new unpublished work from our lab, um, looking at the role of DARP32 in growth and resistance mechanisms of EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer. So we're going to shift um, back to non-small cell lung cancer and look at the role of DARP32 in EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer. So um, a variety of oncogenic driver events are present in non-small cell lung cancer, particular lung adenocarcinoma. And EGFR and KRAS are among the most prevalent in early stage, um, about 14.2% of early stage lung cancer patients um, are found to have EGFR mutations. And that number more than doubles in metastatic lung adenocarcinoma or patients that are diagnosed with advanced disease. So EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer, um, as most of you know, can be treat is treated with first-line EGFR TKI inhibitors. So the recommended first-line therapy for EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer is treatment with um, EGFR TKIs. And in the early 2000s, so in 2003 and 2004, um, for gefitinib and erlotinib respectively, these EGFR TKIs were approved as first line treatment for EGFR mutated lung cancer. Um, unfortunately, after treatment with EGFR TKI, patients frequently develop progressive disease. And one of the most common resistance mechanisms is a T790M point mutation. Um, Osimertinib was developed as a drug that could target this mutation. So patients could be treated with third generation EGFR TKI osimertinib, and which would be effective if they had the T790M mutation in some cases. Um, more recently, osimertinib has been shown to be more effective as a first line treatment than the first and second generation EGFR TKIs. So in the United States, it's been approved and is recommended first line therapy for um, EGFR activating mutations um, in lung cancer. Um, so it's effective against both um, EGFR activating mutations as well as the T790N secondary mutation. So um, this is just a brief overview of some of the resistant mechanisms to EGFR TKIs. So as I mentioned, T790M is a mutation that can occur to confer resistance to first or second generation EGFR TKIs, and um, they're listed here. And other resistant mechanisms, which I'm going to speak about, include oncogenic kinase switches, including um, EG amplification of EGFR, um, ERBB2 or HER2, ERBB3, MET amplification, and other um, receptor tyrosine kinases. So we hypothesized that DARP32 might stimulate the formation of EGFR ERBB3 heterodimers to promote resistance to EGFR TKIs in non-small cell lung cancer. So this cartoon shows our proposed model where EGFR, EGFR homodimers are sensitive to gefitinib and gefitinib causes an inhibition of the oncogenic signaling that occurs. But when we hypothesize DARP32 might play a role in mediating this switch where EGFR forms heterodimers with ERBB3, which can help confer resistance to EGFR TKIs and potentiate oncogenic signaling. 
Um, part of our rationale for this is that DARP32 overexpression protects non-small cell lung cancer cells from apoptosis via activation of AKT, PA3 kinase signaling, and MEK and ERK signaling. And there has been a prior report showing that DARP32 can inter increase interactions between EGFR and ERBB3 to promote gastric tumor resistance um, to gifatinib. So um, I'm going to briefly talk about the cell lines that we're going to use as models in these studies. So um, in the EGFR, TKI sensitizing mutations include in XN21 an L858R mutation. And we're going to be, or we use um, a cell line PC9 parental cells that have the L58R mutation in our gefetinib sensitive that we received from Dr. Aaron Hadda's group and HCC827 parental cells, which um, have a common deletion that occurs in exon 20 that um, is an EGFR activating mutation. And those cells we obtained from Dr. Jane's lab. Um, and then the paired resistant cells um, for PC9, um, there's two different gefetinib resistant um, pairs that go along with these cells that we use as a model that are gefetinib resistant due to late and early T790M mutations. And then um, the HCC827 gefetinib resistant cell line has a CMAT amplification that confers resistance to gefetinib. So we wanted to determine whether DARP32 is capable of protecting EGFR mutated lung adenocarcinoma cells from EGFR TKI induced cell death. So again, apologies for a busy slide, but um, to summarize a large amount of in vitro work um, in a short amount of time, we showed that DARP32 is upregulated in gefetinib resistant PC9 and HCC827 lung adenocarcinoma cells, um, which are EGFR mutated. Um, we show that DARP32 protein overexpression increases the gefetinib IC50 value in these cells, and DARP32 silencing increases gefetinib induced apoptosis in EGFR TKI resistant PC9 cells. So um, here, as well as A27 cells. So here, for example, I'm showing the data from the HCC A27 cells. Um, we also showed this in PC9 um, that as when we silence these cell lines, um, DARP32 in these cell lines, sorry, we see an increase in apoptosis. And then conversely, when we overexpress DARP32 or TDARP, we see a decrease in apoptosis um, through an exit 5 staining as well as um, PARP and caspase cleavage. So um, we show that DARP32 and TDARP interact directly with um, EGFR and ERBB3 through um, co-amino precipitation experiments. So um, when we overexpress DARP32 and TDARP in um, our parental cells, we see that there is um, an increase in DARP32 association um, with EGFR and ERBB3. Um, in both the cell lines. And we see this um, with ERBB3 when we overexpress DARP32 as well as EGFR. Um, and then we can also show that um, the DARP32 interaction with ERBB3 is increased in EGFR TKI resistant cells. So um, when we compare the resistant cells to the um, sensitive cells, in particular, it's most evident with the PC9, we see an increase in DARP32 association with ERBB3, which definitely isn't conclusive evidence, but it might suggest that um, DARP32, if it's interacting with ERBB3, might be playing a role with recruiting ERBB3 to EGFR to mediate this EGFR-EGFR 
homo dimer to EGFR, ERBB3 header dimer switch. So to look at this further, we overexpressed, we looked at DARP32 overexpression and how that correlates with increased phospho ERBB3 in EGFR sensitive lung adenocarcinoma cells. So here we're looking at the EGFR mutated PC9 parental cells, which are gefetinib sensitive. And when we treat, and we're looking at phospho ERBB3 and phospho EGFR by immunofluorescence. And when we treat with gefetinib, we see an increase. We, we see that there's no increase. There's a slight increase, but it's not statistically significant. We see a slight increase in um, the lax Z, but there's a more drastic increase um, with DARP32 and TDARP, but then for phospho ERBB3, but we don't see that increase um, with phospho EGFR, but we do see um, this decrease in lax Z. So this data might be suggesting that there's um, a correlation between DARP32 overexpression and phospho ERBB3 increase. So next, um, we did a similar experiment where we knocked down DARP32 and looked at um, phospho ERBB3 intensity and phospho EGFR staining. And we see that um, there's no change in phospho ERBB3. But then when we knock down DARP32, we see that there's a decrease in phospho ERBB3, but we don't see that decrease with phospho EGFR because we're, we expect that there's a switch from EGFR, EGFR homodimers to EGFR ERBB3 header dimers. And then we also performed a proximity ligation assay, which assesses um, phospho ERBB3, phospho EGFR header dimer formation. So here, the way this assay works is when um, two antibodies, one used to detect phospho ERBB3 and one used to detect phospho EGFR, when they detect um, header dimers or when they come in contact with each other, you get a red signal. So basically this is an assessment of, as I mentioned, phospho ERBB3 and phospho EGFR header dimers. And we see that there is a decrease in that header dimer formation when we knock down DARP32. So when we treat with gefetinib, as we'd expect, we see an increase in header dimer formation um, because it might be a mechanism the cells are using to try to resist um, or develop resistance to gefetinib. And then we see a decrease when we knock down DARP32 or there's no statistical significant difference. So um, next we wanted to look at this in vivo. So um, we silenced DARP32 um, in these cells, as I've mentioned, and we treat it with gefetinib. So basically we inject the HCC A27 gefetinib resistant cells, and um, these cells have DARP32 um, knocked down. And then we administer gefetinib every other day for about two weeks and um, look at the pretreatment luciferase imaging and the post-treatment. And we see that the gefetinib treatment in the controls doesn't cause a statistical difference because um, the xenografts are gefetinib resistant. But then when we knock down DARP32, this sensitizes the xenotransplants to um, gefetinib treatment. And we show by KI67 staining a measure of proliferation that um, in the, here in the, um, with the DARP32 SH, sorry, I think this should be the control. Um, oh, with the vehicle, we see that there's an increase. And then here, um, when we treat with gefetinib, you see that there is no um, change in, um, no increased proliferation. So with the lax SHRNA, you're seeing increased proliferation, but this K67 staining correlates to what we see in terms of the luciferase imaging where there's um, less tumor growth or proliferation. Um, similarly, when we overexpress DARP32, we can see a decrease in EGFR TKI 
induce sensitivity in orthotopic models. So um, when we overexpress DARP32 um, in the parental cells, that causes the cells to be more resistant to EGFR TKI treatment. So as you can see with the control, the gefitinib is um, effective at reducing tumor growth, but it's much less effective when we overexpress DARP32. So finally, we wanted to look at the translational relevance of this um, using patient specimens. So um, we collaborated with Dr. Zhang at, in China to look at a paired cohort of patient-derived specimens before and after the development of EGFR TKI resistance. So um, from 30 patients that were treated with either Jafetinib or Latinib, um, we saw that there were we specimens were obtained before treatment and then after progressive disease occurred. And then we could look at these paired specimens. And we see that um, as we hypothesized, DARP32 levels are increased in the EGFR TKI resistant specimens relative to their paired baseline specimens. We also see um, an increase in phospho-EGFR and phospho-ERBB3 in the specimens from patients um, when they developed resistance. So to summarize this part of my talk, um, DARP32 protects lung adenal carcinoma cells from EGFR TKI to induce cell death. Um, we show that DARP32 interacts with ERBB3 and that's in interactions increased in EGFR TKI resistant cells. Um, we provide evidence that suggests DARP32 might play a role in um, the process of EGFR ERBB3 heterodimer formation to promote gefitinib resistance. And we show that overexpression of DARP32 is in associated with EGFR TKI refractory tumor growth. And then as I just showed, DARP32 phospho-EGFR and phospho-ERBB3 protein expression increases in paired pre and post EGFR TKI resistant specimens from lung adenocarcinoma patients with EGFR mutations. So um, just to briefly talk about future directions, um, we plan to assess the role of DARP32 in asimertinib resistance um, and also look at DARP32 independent mechanisms of asimertinib refractory disease. So because asimertinib has only been FDA approved as a frontline therapy for the last several years, its mechanisms of resistance um, still require um, a lot of investigation. So that's something that we're interested in pursuing and would love, love to collaborate with others on. Um, we're also looking at ways we could target DARP32 um, using adenal associated virus um, to specifically target DARP32 in tumor cells in collaboration with um, my colleague at the Hormel Institute, Dr. George Esplanidi. Um, we're also um, interested in looking at the precise mechanisms by which DARP32 activates AKT and PA3 kinase signaling. So it's known that DARP32 activates this oncogenic signaling, but precisely how DARP32 activates AKT and PA3 kinase signaling isn't known. It might have important therapeutic implications, especially a, rather than targeting DARP32, um, the AKT and PA3 kinase signaling was targeted. Um, we're interested in investigating how DARP32 and IKK-alpha interact to drive non-small cell lung cancer growth. So um, I showed some, I, I guess I just, summarized some work showing that um, we have shown that DARP32 and IKK interact, but we're working on describing those molecular details. And then finally, um, testing how DARP32 could act as a predictive marker for the propensity to develop EGFR TKI resistance. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank um, those who did the work, um, primarily Dr. Kayam alum who um, led all three of the studies that I talked about today. Um, Dr. Lee Wong, who made significant contributions and really helped um, with all this um, lung cancer work along with other current members of my group. Um, collaborators, um, 
at the Hormel Institute and the Masonic Cancer Center and beyond. And um, I'd like to thank those who have shared um, resources as well as um, thank my sources of funding. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. All right, that's great. Uh, thank you, Luke. Um, the uh, floor is open for questions. You can either raise your hand and I'll call on you to ask your question or um, you can post a question into the chat. While we're waiting for hands, maybe I'll ask one. So uh, on DARP 32, uh, um, just thinking about ways to, uh, to develop therapeutics against it, would you envision a scenario about developing molecules that actually bind and maybe degrade it because it's not enzymatic, right? Or, or would it be a better approach be to target upstream factors that drive its, you know, um, the pr production of the protein? Yeah, that's a great question, Dan. So I think that the best approach would be to the former approach or maybe not best, but like in terms of targeting DARP32 directly, it's a challenge because it's, only 32 kilodaltons. So like there's no protein structure known for it. It hasn't been crystallized. So that makes it difficult to design um, small molecule inhibitors or something like that for it. Um, there's emerging evidence that um, antisense oligos could be used to target undruggable targets. So that could be one approach that could be used. Um, but as you mentioned, um, short of targeting DARP32 itself, either with oligos or through a drug screening approach, um, targeting AKT um, and PI3 kinase signaling is another viable approach. So um, I know like there's a AKT mTOR inhibitor called um, Dactosolib, um, which has proven effective in inhibiting um, AKT and mTOR signaling. So using an inhibitor such as that might have um, an effect where DARP32 is causing this oncogenic signaling along with other factors, of course, and maybe you're better off just targeting AKT, P3 kinase, mTOR signaling cascade as opposed to DARP32 directly. Thanks. Thank you. We have any other questions? Okay. Uh, uh, Julie. Thanks. Hi, Luke. Nice talk. Hi, Julie. Hi. Um, I was curious have you shown that? DARP32 is specific for IKK alpha, or will it interact with other IKK family members or the non canonical IKK specifically? Yeah, that's a really good question, Julie. So we showed in our 2018 communications biology paper that DARP32 can interact directly with IKK alpha by um, IP. And then subsequently, we've been doing work to show that like in vitro kinase assays and such to show that IKK alpha is capable of directly phosphorylating DARP32. So to answer your question, we haven't really looked extensively at other IKK family members. So I believe back when we were doing the studies that got published in communications biology several years ago, we did look somewhat at IKK beta and it seemed like IKK alpha was more prevalent and that's why we went that route. So I don't think we've conclusively ruled out other IKKs, but we haven't very extensively looked either. Okay, and I guess, is, did you show like specific like P52 translocation and did you look at any of the other nf kappa B subunits? Yeah, so we saw NF we saw P52 translocation. Um, we, it's been shown previously that DARP32 can regulate um, 
canonical NF kappa B signaling. So we focused more on um, non canonical NF kappa B2 signaling. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the chat from David Largaspada. Uh, the question is, is knockout of DARP sufficient to block oncogenic effects of notch in lung cancer? That's a really good question. Thank you, David. So um, we tried doing some studies that addressed that question in non-small cell lung cancer. We hadn't done it in SCLC, but we use some spontaneous EGFR um, activating mutation driven mice. So like um, mice that got um, EGFR mutated lung cancer by activation of EGFR oncogene. And we crossed those to DARP32 knockout mice. And we didn't see that DARP32 knockout was protective in EGFR mutated lung cancer to prevent the lung cancer. So I think like the reason for that is like DARP32 is more of like a passenger mutation is not necessarily a driver mutation. Um, so based on the EGFR mutated lung cancer studies, my guess would be that in SCLC, it'd be a similar type of effect, but um, we haven't directly addressed that in SCLC. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, I, I don't see any more. So uh, uh, Luke, thank you for a, a fantastic seminar, really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, thanks everyone for attending today's uh, seminar. Thanks everyone, I really appreciate the opportunity.